San Antonio. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. Today I want to um, cover some ground with you. I want you to keep your Bibles handy. You're going to need them. We're going to cover a lot of ground here in the next chapel in an hour and a half. I'm probably going to go near that long. Glory to God. You know me, friends. I'm short-winded. No, I won't go. go. I'm going to keep my eye on the clock because I know that your mind comprehend more than your past. Brother Bill Patrick, what would you say? It's prayer. How many of you know you don't have a revival without prayer? If someone were to say to me, Brother Kilpatrick, what would you say would be the second prerequisite for revival? I would say it's going to be what I'm going to talk about today. Now, I have with me the material that I'm going to talk about. The most common series that I deal with when I speak about blessings is this one here. It's called Mystery and Power of a Blessing. I'm not going to deal with that today because I've preached this so many times. I don't know how many hundreds of times I've preached this message. It's actually a series of four. But this is probably out of our ministry the most popular thing we've ever preached, I would imagine. I don't know how many thousands of copies has gone out over the world. And it's a four-part series on the mystery and power of a blessing. And I'd really like to encourage you to go by the table and pick this up because it's like a handbook on blessings. And I'm, on, I'm not going to preach this message today, but I'm going to preach another message on blessings that I want you to really get in your spirit and absorb because I'm telling you to change your life. It changed my life, and it changed the life of this church. A while ago, Chaplin said in his message, he said, how does a church die? And I whispered to the young man next to me, I said, from the pulpit out. A church dies from the pulpit out. And it's a hard thing for a church to die if the pastor is alive and on fire. It's a hard thing for a church to be alive if the pastor's dead. You follow me? So I think whenever he asks the question, how does a church die, I believe it dies from the pulpit out. But God began to deal with me here, and I'll just tell you a couple of little stories real quick, and then we'll get down to the crux of the matter, some new material. On this series, Mr. and Powerful Blessing, as I said, there's four tapes here. Actually, I have it here with the latest part that I preached. I preached this in January here at Brownsville, and I don't know how many thousands of that tape went out of that service that night, and it's an encapsulation of everything that we've talked about through the years on blessings. And we've added that to this, which is, this is the same thing as this with just that extra tape added in there. But it's the mystery and power of a blessing. When you go by and pick that up, you might want to just jot that down. When you go by a tape table, a lot of times you don't know what's out there unless somebody tells you. But you might want to just jot that down when you go by the tape table. It's called the mystery and power of a blessing. That'll really help you, and it'll be like a handbook it will also be something that you can give to your children, you can give to your pastor, you can give to other people. It changed my life. And I'll just tell you this, from the time we dedicated the new building across the street, we dedicated it January the 13th, 1991. From the time we dedicated that new building, I was in the church one day praying and the Lord began to deal with me about making it a house of prayer, breaking traditions of man, not worrying about fear of man. And the Lord said, I want you to begin to move in directions that you haven't moved in before, but I don't want you to be afraid of man. And I like tradition if tradition is good and wholesome and healthy for the moment, but I don't believe, on, believe in holding on to traditions if they're not working. Are you listening to me? And I'm not afraid to break them. It doesn't bother me. And I'm really... I, I guess I have some fear of man like we all do, but I don't have a lot of it. If I know God wants me to do something, I'll be bold as a lion. and I'll do it. If my church goes from 5,000 down to 500 or 50, hey, 
Gideon's army went down from 32,000 to 300. But you can do more with 300 than you can 32,000. Are you listening to me? And so the Lord began to deal with me about making it a house of prayer. And then one of the things that God began to deal with me in tandem with that was God began to speak to my heart about making Brownsville a house of blessings. And the first sermon that I preached on the, on the mystery and power of a blessing, the one I just laid down here, the first sermon I preached on the mystery and power of a blessing, when I got up that Sunday morning to preach it, I have to be honest with you and tell you there was a different atmosphere that morning when I opened my mouth to speak that message for the first time. I was just going to preach one part. I just had one sermon on it, but I didn't know it was going to lead to multi-parts. And I didn't know it was going to change me like it did. I didn't know it was going to lead from one thing to the other in the church. I didn't know it was going to prep everything for revival. I didn't know. I stumbled up on it. And so whenever I began preaching on Mystery and Power of a Blessing that morning, when I opened my mouth, I had my lapel mic on, when I opened my mouth, there was just something there. I can't explain it. It was not just a sermon. And it was not just a congregation just hearing another sermon. It was like a rapt attention from the time I opened my mouth. And that church heated it, they caught it, they absorbed it. It got ingrained in their DNA of the spirit of this church. And man, wow. I went home that afternoon, I sat down in my recliner, took out my yellow legal pad, and I wrote a blessing out over the church. And I didn't stop, I didn't even erase one word. I didn't stop until it was completely finished. And if you go by our table out there, Partners in Revival out there in the foyer, I mean out there in the tent, we'll have you pick up one of these. It's a pastoral blessing that I wrote over Brownsville. And I began speaking it every week over Brownsville. So it's a pastoral blessing. And whenever I wrote it out and I spoke it for the first time, I'm telling you, friend, you would not believe. Just words. It's not a confession, but it's more like a proclamation. There's a difference in a confession and a proclamation. And when I made that proclamation of the blessing and I read it over the congregation for the first time, people started crying and shaking in the church when I started reading it over them. And I knew then, whenever I read that blessing for the first time, I knew, man, my God, I'm on to something. I didn't know what. And then the phone began to ring immediately the next week. People began to call the church saying, Brother Kilpatrick, you won't believe what's happened. So-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. And in this blessing, that I would speak over the congregation, I'd say things like, for example, Lord, I speak a blessing over Brownsville. I speak that you protect them, Lord, and there be, uh, that you keep them from acts of violence. I speak that you keep them from accidents. I speak, Lord, that you bless them in their homes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And man, the phone began to ring the next week like it had never rung before. And testimonies began to come in. And then I spoke at the next Sunday. And then I spoke at the next Sunday. And then I spoke at the next Sunday. And about the next Sunday, we had a great service and I forgot to bless the people. And I said, God bless you folks, we'll see you Wednesday night. And I was walking out the door and the church just stood there like this and folded their arms. <laughs> and they wouldn't leave. And I said, is something wrong? They said, you didn't bless us. And I had to come back and read that blessing over them and they stood there like little birds with their mouth open, you know. And whenever I speak a blessing in the Bible, whenever a blessing was administered, the one administering the blessing usually would do it with the right hand extended, and the person receiving the blessing would receive it with the right hand extended. And so I'd always have Brownsville stand up and I'd bless them as their pastor. I'd bless them. It was like a, a doxology at the end of the service. You know, I'd just bless them. And man, just the testimonies was unbelievable. Unbelievable. And so... I've got that if you'd like to go by and pick that up. And then I first started blessing the orchestra pit, bam, change. Started blessing the choir, bam. I blessed it and I said, Lord, anybody that's in the choir that shouldn't be there, they're there for self-aggrandizement. Anybody that's in the choir for a showcase of their talents and for applause of man, I ask you to take them out. And I said, those that are there because of pride reasons, those that are there for traditional reasons, and they're not there to truly worship God, I ask you to take them out. The choir went from 67 to 26. And I was just only doing this in my private time in prayer. 
choir director came to me one Sunday and he said, Brother Kilpatrick, there's only 26 in the choir. And I said, well, <laughs> hallelujah. You really heard me, didn't you, Lord? But then it went down to 26, and when it went down to 26, first news you know, it went to 90. And then I would go and bless every seat in the choir, and here's what I'd say. I'd say, Holy Spirit, I bless every seat in the choir, and there was nobody there, I just bless it. I'm not praying now. I want you to say something with me. Prayer is prayer. Prophecy is prophecy. Blessing is blessing. And the three never meet. Say it with me. Prayer is prayer. Prophecy is prophecy. Blessing is blessing. Now listen to me. I used to think whenever I read blessings in the Old Testament like a patriarch would bless his sons, like Jacob was blessing his 12 sons, I, I thought it was prophesying. But Jacob was not prophesying. Jacob was speaking his desires over his children. It sounded poetic, it sounded prophetic, but it was not poetic or prophetic, it was a blessing. Are you hearing me? And prayer is petitioning God. Prayer is soliciting divine supernatural intervention. So prophecy is foretelling the future as though it's history. Prayer is solicitation of divine intervention, but blessing is neither of the two. And how many times do we mess up and we do it all wrong because we don't understand it it's like we say, um, uh, we're going to bless the offering, and we bow our head and pray. We're not blessing the offering, we're praying over the offering. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, you know, that's praying. Blessing is not done with the eyes closed, it's not done on your knees, it's done with your eyes wide open and with your hands extended. Amen. You listening to me? And we say, we're going to bless the offering. We're going to bless the food. No, you're going to pray over the food. Lord, we ask you to bless this food. See, you're not blessing. You're asking God to do something. You're praying. You follow me? Y'all getting quiet on me. Are you out there? Make some racket. I, 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 know, I know you're absorbent. I know you are. But just, just stay with me here for a minute. We say we're going to bless the food, and then we solicit God, and we ask God to do it. We're putting it off on him. The Lord said, you bless. You do it. In the book of Peter, the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, the Bible says that we are called to bless and to be a blessing. You want to see that right quick? Look in the book of 1 Peter. Tell me in your Bibles real quick, and I don't have much time to spend here, but let's go there real quick. 1 Peter, chapter 3, and verse 8. Here's what it says. Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love his brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Look at verse 9. Don't render evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrawise, blessing, knowing that you are thereunto called, and that you should inherit a blessing. Look this way just for a minute. You know what this is? This is clockwise. This is the way the clock goes. You know what counterclockwise is? That's counterclockwise, going against things. Clockwise, counterclockwise. I don't know about you, but I have clocks, old, I have old clock, and I don't ever like to take those hands and turn them back. Turn them forward, but I don't like to turn them back. It goes against things. It, it fools with the mechanisms on the inside. Go this way, but you go that way. It's contrawise. See, the way the world is, is railing for railing. <laughs> and evil for evil. <laughs> but the Bible says, but contrawise. Blessing. Whenever things are going wrong, don't curse it. If you ever get thrown in the lion's den, don't curse Leo. <laughs> Go in there and bless every lion in the house. Can you say amen? <laughs> Leo, whoo, I bless you, boy. You are not hungry, Leo. You, you be at peace, Leo. You are not angry and you are not hungry. Waller boy over there lay down, but you don't want none of me. I bless you.
bless you, Leo. Amen. That's what you do. If you go in there and say, and poke him in the eye, you're going to lose your arm. Amen. That's the way life is. But the Bible says, don't render evil for evil, not railing for railing, but contrawise, go against the grain, and bless. When you bless something, you're going to, it is different from confession, totally different from confession. It's an art that God gives us in the Bible that's lost in the New Testament, but it was very prevalent in the Old Testament. And so let me tell you what happened. Then the Lord began to speak to my heart, and he said, not only have you blessed the choir, and I began to bless the congregation, I began to bless the church, empty pews. As I began to bless the empty pews, I'd speak a different blessing over each section of pews in Brownsville. I'd go in there while the church was empty, and I'd just begin to stretch my hands out like a priest and begin to bless the empty pews, and I'd spend hours doing it. Yeah, a different blessing over each section. I wouldn't get in a rut and just do it out of, out of memory. I'd do it out of my heart every week. And I'd just speak a blessing, release a blessing. I wasn't praying, I wasn't prophesying, but I was blessing those pews. And I was speaking a blessing on those pews so when people came in the next day, something would be on those pews that would affect that crowd. I began to bless the environment of the congregation. I could not believe. I prayed for years. In prayer, I still pray. Of course, you must pray. But I could not believe tapping in to the mystery and the power of a blessing, what a major difference it made in my life and what a difference it made in this church. It was shocking. Then the Lord spoke to me and he said, I want you to go to every room in your house. And he said, I want you to speak a blessing. Take, uh, Brenda and I began to serve communion to each other in our house once a week. And as we began to serve communion in our home once a week, I'd give it to her, she'd give it to me and we would partake and bless one another. And then the Lord said, I want you to start blessing your home. And I would take some of the wine, not wine, but some of the grape juice, and I would uh, anoint the, the lentil over the door that goes into every room. And in my home, I would speak in the bedroom. I'd pronounce a blessing of restful sleep. I'd quote Psalms 3 and 5. I lay down and slept. I awoke, and the Lord sustained me. I will both lie down in peace and sleep, for you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. I'd speak that blessing. I could not believe the difference. I've always been a light sleeper. I can hear water dripping outside with the windows down and, and storm windows on them. I can hear water dripping outside. I got ears like I don't know what. Don't you come in either, friend. But I would, I, I've always been a light sleeper, very light sleeper. I began to sleep so hard in my home that I'd wake up slobbering on my pillow. How many of you have ever slept so hard you drooled? Oh, glory to God, that's good sleep. Can you say amen? Woo! Yeah. Wake up and just, oh, man. I'd never drooled like that. It's been, it's been years since I was a kid I slept that sound. And I'd wake up and I'd think, well, Brenda, what? Why am I drooling? Am I sick? She said, no, crazy. You've been blessing the house. I, yeah, right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then I began to bless the bathroom. And I'd speak over the bathroom, Exodus 15, 26. I'd speak health over the bathroom. If you'll diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what's right in his sight and give ear to his word, he'll put none of these diseases on you which you brought upon the Egyptians. I am the Lord thy God that healeth thee. In the kitchen, I would speak blessings of provision and strength, Exodus 23, 25. So shall you serve the Lord, your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and he will take sickness away from the midst of thee. In the living room, the great den, uh, the great room or the den, I would speak Joshua 24, 15. As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. May singing and praises and talking of God's goodness and faithfulness be heard in this room. And in the entry hall, in the entry in the hallway, I would say, God shall bless our goings out and our comings in. And if we acknowledge him in all of our ways, he has promised to direct our path. And that's just some of the blessings that I would speak over my house. Let me tell you what happened. As I began to bless our home, it was remarkable. Remarkable. I can't tell you how, what a difference. And friend, I'm not one to, to, you know, exaggerate and stretch things. This happened. I could not believe it. As a matter of fact, let me tell you a little story. 
before revival broke out in Brownsville, it actually broke out in our home first. I'd leave and go to work in the morning, and I'd leave Brenda in my recliner. When I'd come home in the afternoon from my appointments, she would be still sitting in that chair with a wall of Kleenex around that chair where she couldn't even get up out of that chair all day long under the glory of God. The glory was so strong in our house, she couldn't even move and, and, and maneuver. And I'd come home and she'd still be in that chair and there'd just be a wall of Kleenex all around her chair. And when I'd walk in that house, whew, you could feel the glory and the power of God. It was remarkable. And we started having services on our back porch on Friday nights before revival ever broke out in Brownsville from about March, February, March, until it broke out in June on Father's Day of 95. We started having revival services on our back porch. And the first time I ever saw Lyndall Cooley prophesy was laying under my swing on the cement on my back porch. And he had his hands up in the dark and was worshiping God laying on that cement and prophesying under my swing. And there was about 25 people on my back porch laid out on the power of God. And I was just crying as I saw that. And I was just crying and saying, God, will it ever happen in Brownsville? But see, that blessing was there first in that house before the kiss of God came and kissed the environment of the sanctuary. I was actually doing it first in our home before I was doing it in the sanctuary. And let me tell you something about an environment. Y'all listening to me? Let me tell you something about an environment. An environment is a lot like soil. It's a lot like ground. Right now, we're sort of in a drought down here in Florida. And when it hasn't rained for a long time, the ground gets real dry and it begins to crack apart. And after a long period of time of drought, whenever it does rain, it may have to rain a day or two days or three days. It may just drizzle or it may just be a nice sprinkle, but it may have to rain for quite a while before that ground gets filled back up with water. And then after it fills back up, then you'll see it pooling in your backyard. That's called saturation. But before the ground gets full and before the water will pool in your yard and get saturated, it's soaking in. Let me tell you something about an environment. The environment of your home and the environment of your church is like soil. So many times, the environment of our home is drought stricken because of all the curses we've released in our home, over our mates, over our children. The environment in our churches is drought stricken because of so many people cursing the pastor, not cussing him, but cursing him. Cursing the pastor, cursing the staff, cursing the songs, they don't like the songs. They don't like the way we sing them. They don't like the tunes. They don't like the music director. They don't like the choir. They don't like the duration of the pastor's sermon. They don't like the content of his sermon. They don't like the new sign out by the road. They don't like this. They don't like what he drives. They don't like anything. And they just curse, curse, curse. And it's like a famine comes in that environment of that church. And God began to speak to me and he said, tell Brownsville. And they've always been a wonderful church. But the Lord said, tell them that the environment is like a soil and it's got to be prepped. And if I'm going to do what I want to do, the environment has got to be prepped. And so I began speaking these blessings. And when I first spoke it on the first Sunday, the pastoral blessing, it was like, oh my God, like nothing happened. It was wonderful. I didn't feel anything, but reports began to come, but I didn't feel anything. The next time I spoke it, it was like breakthrough, wonderful, it was good, a little bit of a breakthrough, and the environment got saturated, I got rained on some more. Spoke it another Sunday, more testimonies, the, the soil got filled up some more of the atmosphere. One day I came in there, weeks later, I said, hold your hand up, I'm gonna bless you. They held their hand up, I held my hand up, I started reading that pastoral blessing, bam, when I did, saturation. The curses were gone. The soil of the atmosphere had been absorbed and the blessings run over and pooled over and started standing in the church. That's when you came in church and people was just thrilled and exhilarated about being there. I want to ask you a question. Friend, listen to me. You ever been in a room 
our house and the atmosphere wasn't right. You know how you feel? The other day I was at a hospital in Mobile and I walked in over there and we had an emergency and I, I went in that hospital room and it was a, just hospital looked like squalor. And the emergency room, I was in there with this young boy and, and I walked in there and I just got the heebie-jeebies. I just felt, it just felt hellish. Felt like death. I couldn't wait to get out of there. And I've been in homes like that where when you walk in there, it's like mom and dad's there and the kids are there, but there's something there that ain't right. I've been in churches before where they had the music and they had the singing and they had all the calisthenics of religion and they had everything. They had the preacher and they had all this, you know, but something, the atmosphere, something was wrong. And then I've been in other places where it didn't look like too much, but when you walked in, whoo, man, the Holy Ghost was in the house. Are you listening to what I'm saying? And I want to ask you a question. If the Spirit of God and if that atmosphere is like that in a home, you know what will happen to a home like that where dad loves mom and he's faithful to mom sexually and mom loves dad and she's faithful to him sexually and they respect one another and love one another and they love their children. You know what? Those kids grow up in that house. They don't even want to leave home. They sit around the table. They eat their meals. There's a warmth there. There's a fellowship there. There's a sharing there. Boy, those kids love dad and mom, and mom and dad loves those kids. They'll fight for one another. That home is happy because there's blessings there. The parents bless the kids, and the kids bless the parents. And you walk in, you can feel that. I got a question for you. If that's true in a home, how is it true in a sanctuary? When people come in a sanctuary, and they have cursed the pastor and they've cursed everything that's took place and they're, they're, they're irreconcilable and, and there's a bad spirit in the place and it's just, uh, it's harsh and it's cold. Whenever they're singing, they're saying to themselves, my God, we've been standing 25 minutes. How much longer we got to stand and sing? And they're looking at their watch. They're looking at their watch. Oh, I hope they'll be through her. I hope they'll hurry. And you're thinking about the mashed potatoes and roast beef when you get out of church. And then the preacher starts preaching and you roll your eyes in your head and you're saying, oh God, how long is he gonna to preach today? Last week he preached 25 minutes. And while the whole time he's preaching, you're watching your watch like this, you know why? Because something's not right in the atmosphere. I got something to tell you. When the atmosphere of a church gets right and people walk through the doors, they put at ease, there's a warmth there, and you don't even want to leave. You're not thinking about mashed potatoes and roast beef. You're not thinking about how long he's preaching. You're not thinking about how long you're standing to sing. It's like, oh God, I have learned and longed to be in your presence over this last week. Are you listening? That atmosphere will soak in a blessing, but it'll also soak in a curse. And when, 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 when an atmosphere in a church is not right, I don't care how good that preacher has studied, I don't care how long he studied, I don't care what the content of his sermon is, when he gets up there behind that pulpit to preach on Sunday morning, if there's a curse in the environment of that church, he struggles. You can take that same preacher and put him in a good church, a small church, where there's a wonderful family atmosphere and the Holy Spirit is there because he kisses it and there's, there's blessings instead of curses. And you can take an average preacher and he'll preach like a house is on fire. See what I'm saying? And so God began to deal with me and he began to say to me, this is what I want you to do. And so I have the blessings on the home. And then I have 30 specific areas that you may address when blessing your child or grandchild. There's 30 specific areas there. And then recently I've been doing this Tyler's Blessing over Brownsville. We have a copy of that out there at our table also. And then we have the blessings on a home and then I have just recently on May the 30th, I wrote a blessing for Jerusalem and all of Israel. And I'll tell you about that probably Wednesday night. Don't have time to cover that right now. But I want you to go with me in your scriptures. I've got to really hurry. By the way, what I'm going to be dealing with today is entitled The Blessing. It's not blessings plural, it's singular. It's a four-part series on the blessing. So let's get right to it. Turn with me, please, to the book of Proverbs. Proverbs. 
Proverbs chapter 10. Don't let this scripture spook you, friend, because we're not prosperity preaching church here. We're really not. I just want to read you the scripture to make a point. Look at Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 22. The Bible says, the blessing. Say it with me. It does not say blessings plural. It says the blessing of the Lord. It maketh rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. Look this way for a moment. You say, Brother Kilpatrick, can the devil bless? The devil can give people things, but he's an Indian giver. He takes it back. And the devil gives people things. He doesn't bless them with things. He gives people things. He not only takes it back, but it, he adds sorrow with it. How many of you have seen rich people that had so-called blessings, but they were absolutely miserable, blew their brains out? Elvis Presley had everything, but he was miserable. Why? Because he had things that the devil anointed him and gave it to him, but yet there was sorrow associated with it. Now, I want you to go real quick to Deuteronomy 28, and I want to show you something here, and then I want to get right involved in the message today. Deuteronomy 28, and I want you to look at verse 8 with me, please. Deuteronomy 28, we're going to look at that same word again, the blessing. 28 and verse 8. The Lord shall command, say it with me, the blessing upon you in thy storehouses and in all that you set your hand to. He shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Look at verse 8 one more time. The Lord shall command the blessing. Proverbs said the blessing of the Lord it maketh rich, and it addeth no sorrow. Now, with those two scriptures established, I want to take you on a little journey this morning for just a little while. I want to show you Abraham. I want to show you Isaac. I want to show you Jacob. And then I'm going to show you something really powerful at the end of the message, so stay with me through the very end. Got something that I'm going to take you to in the, book, in the New Testament, the book of Luke. I want to show you this. Just blow your mind, friend, when you see it. Now, Usually whenever you think about people that does well in life, you think about people that's got good educations like Princeton, Harvard, Oxford. You think about um, people that are well-educated. Um, they've gone through the institutions of higher learning. They've been prepped. They've been groomed. They're ready. They're smart. They're brilliant. And they go out into the world, and the world's waiting on them, and there's money to be made. Whenever you think about people like that, that's what I usually think about is like attorneys, think about doctors, and they do well, and all that kind of stuff. That's what we think of in the world, people doing good. We think about industrious business people that uh, went to you know, schools on um, finance, economy, economists, that type thing, and they do good. That's wonderful. But so many times, the earnings that they make and the money that they make does not bring them pleasure. And then they become frustrated because they realize that I went to school for all those years. I went out here and I made all this money. I thought I was going to be happy, but I'm sorrowful. I'm not happy. I'm more miserable than I've ever been. It seems like to me I'd give all this up just to make a lot less money to be happy. Now, not everybody can go to Harvard. Not everybody can go to Princeton or Oxford and get a great education like that. So what's God's plan for those that can't get a good education? It's called the blessing of the Lord. God has made provisions for you, and I'm not saying you shouldn't be educated. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying you should not be educated. I'm not saying that you should not strive for higher learning. I'm not saying that at all, because I believe you should. But I'm saying this. I'm saying God has made provisions in his overall scheme of things that for his people, his covenant people, the redeemed society, 
He's made it possible to bypass those areas that you seem like you have to go through, those hoops you have to jump through to get stuff. God's made it possible for the blessing of the Lord to be on your life and it will bring you the things that God wants to bless you with. Now, I will say this. I believe with all my heart that every person that's born again, washed in the blood, has repented of their sins, turned around and are following Christ and becoming a faithful, loyal disciple of Christ, I believe that every one of them is blessed. Here's the problem. I just don't believe all of them have been told that they're blessed. And I don't believe that all of them has been able to stick their needle in that vein because they don't even know about the vein. They had not even been able to stick their needle in that vein and pull out the blessings out of that mine and that vein because they don't even know about it. They haven't been told about it. And so one of the things that the Lord has begun to speak to me about down through these years, and I've been blessing now for over a decade, Brownsville and um, the tithers here at the church and all kinds of things, and it's just been blessing after blessing after blessing. I'm talking about blessings like you can't imagine. And so as I began to move into this realm of blessings, God began to expand me. God will have a hard time expanding a congregation until he's able to expand that minister. As the minister expands, the congregation expands with him. It's just a slight delay response. But as God blesses him and as God educates him and as God gives him revelation, then he shares it with the congregation. It's just like a nursing mother. Whatever that mother eats, the child gets it in a different form but gets the same thing. A, nurse, a pastor is like a nursing mother. He gets it from God, assimilates it, and comes in on Sunday and nurses his congregation what God has given him. And they both grow together. That's what happens. That's what a pastor is. If you don't feed, you don't have anything to nurse that congregation, and that congregation is going to get real miserable. That congregation is going to rise up. They're going to cause you a lot of racket. They're going to cause you a lot of problems. That's why the Lord said, feed my sheep. Amen? Feed my lamb. So anyway, God began to deal with me about the blessing thing. And so he began to show me that there is a way for a man and a woman to excel in life, and I don't like to use the word success even, even though it's in the Bible, the book of Joshua. I don't really like to use the word success, but I like to use the word excel, and I like to use the word blessed. When you look at John Kilpatrick, you're not looking at a man that's highly educated. I have an education, but I'm not highly educated. But when you look at John Kilpatrick, I tell you what you see. You're looking at a man that God has blessed. And I know he has. And I give him all the glory. You hear what I'm saying to you? You say, Brother Kilpatrick, are you rich? No, not like you think I am, no. But I tell you, I am blessed going out and coming in, up risings and down settings. I tell you, brother, you put old John Kilpatrick in a corner and first news you know you're going to look and he's going to be out there in a wide open field. How it happened, I don't know. But God just blessed me, gets me out of tight places and puts me in a wide open place. Amen? Can you say the same thing about yourself? Now, I want to go real quick, and let's, let's start. Let me show you something about Abraham. Here's what we're going to find in the book of Genesis. Go there quickly. Genesis chapter 12. I want to show you something here about Abraham. Somebody says, Brother Kilpatrick, what is a blessing? Let me explain that to you first of all. You know, so many times we walk up to people and we shake their hand and what do we say as a Christian? What do we say? God bless you. You know what? We don't even think about what we say. It's just rhetoric. God bless you. It's like, have a good day. Or how you doing? You know. What would happen if we take somebody's hand and look at them and say, blessings come on you, man. Blessings be on you. See? See, see the difference? We don't even, we don't really realize there's a power associated with it, but you've got to plug into the power and mean it and proclaim it and speak it over a person. Rhetoric won't work. You've got to concentrate and speak it. 
Now, what is a blessing? Let me tell you what a blessing is not. A blessing is not a new car. A blessing is not a new home. It's not land. It's not money. These are only the results of a blessing. Are you hearing me? A blessing, a curse, is more than just a loss of goods. A blessing is a failure in your, or, I'm sorry, a curse is a failure in your spirit. A curse is a failure in your soul and it's failure in your body. It's a force working against you. A curse is something that is negative and dark and it results in failure. A blessing is positive. It is a power. It is something on you that God gives you that causes you to accomplish in life. You're clothed with it. God, look, look this way for a minute. God puts some kind of invisible mantle on you. It's invisible, but it's a vestiture. It's a pedigree that God just drapes across you, and it's a power, it is a, a source from the hand of God that God puts on your life that causes you to excel and to succeed. It is not a car, it is not a home, those are only the results of God putting that blessing on your life. You see, the Bible says this, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. How many of you know that we spend way so much time praying about house payments and car payments and get the transmission fixed when the Bible said, seek ye first the kingdom, the government of God and his righteousness and all these blessings will be added unto you, amen? It reduces it down to seeking God for his government over your life and if you let his government be on your life, the blessings will take care of themselves. Now watch this. It's something that God closes, clothes you with. In Deuteronomy chapter eight, let's go over there just a moment. Deuteronomy chapter eight, I want you to look at verses 17 and 18. Deuteronomy 8, 17 and 18. If you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth, but it said, but thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to excel or to do well, to get wealth. It is he that giveth thee power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant which he swear unto thy fathers. Who was their fathers? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As it is this day. But look what it says. Verse 17 says, don't say my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this. It says, but you shall remember the Lord your God. It is he that giveth thee power. Look this way for a moment. When it says it is he that giveth thee power, what that's saying is it's God that gives you the vestiture. It's God that drapes a mantle across you that causes these things to be attracted in your life. Friend, I want to tell you something. God is blessing his people, and if you're not aware of that, you better get aware of it because it's going to take the blessings of God to make it in this hour. Yeah. Tap into it. Yeah, You've got to tap into it. You've got to know that God has it for you. Understand it, it's not seeking riches, it's not the prosperity gospel, but it has to do with your health, it has to do with the peace of your home, it has to do with church growth, it has to do with everything. Tap into it. Don't be ignorant anymore of the blessings of the Lord. It's a pedigree that God puts on all of his kids, but if you're not aware you've got it, you'll never move in it. Now let me show you something about Abraham. Let's go there real quick. In the book of Genesis, let's go back. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis 12. 
Genesis chapter 12, 1. Abram, I'm sorry. And the Lord said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house into a land that I will show thee. God said, I will make of you a great nation. And here it is for the first time. God said, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. First time in history, right there, chapter 12, verse 1. Let me tell you what's happened. Friend, do you really understand what we're talking about here? From the time God created Adam, he placed Adam in the garden. And how many of you knows when God placed Adam in the garden, he had everything he needed? He had health. He had everything. He had knowledge. Never went to college. He had knowledge. God brought the animals before him. He gave them their zoological names, the plants, the biological names. Adam knew it. He was blessed. Everything he needed, trees of the garden, everything. God gave him his wife. They were happy, blessed, etc. Adam never knew lack until he sinned and Satan came in the picture. When, when Adam sinned, lack came in the picture. Lack is the opposite of blessings. Lack came. Death came. Loss came. Ostracized. And you know, whenever you look at it, just to think about it for a moment, whenever you look at it, now let's just think for a minute. We know that God is good. We know that the devil is evil. We know that heaven is wonderful. We know that hell is horrible. But let's just think about it for a minute. Satan came, and with Satan came lack. Before Satan ever came, God blessed Adam. After Adam sinned, God was pretty well blocked out from his dealings with man because man sinned, and there was a big chasm there. God found a man, he was an idolater, but God saw something in him, his name was Abram, and God said, I want to do something. I want to get back involved in the lives of people on the earth, the humans that I created. God said, Abram, if you'll follow me and diligently hearken to my word, God said, I will bless you, and I will make of you a great blessing. And what the Lord was saying to Abram there was, I can't stand my people living in this hell. I can't stand it. And God said, man, will you walk with me? Will you be a man of principle? Will you be a man of integrity? Will you be my man? Because I want to get back involved in the lives of my people. And God said, if you'll do this, he said, I'll bless you. And then he said, I'll not only bless you, but all that will heed what I'm going to do through, through your life, all that will come in line with what I'm going to do in your life, God said, I will make you a blessing to them. The blessing that I'm going to put on you, I will cause it to come upon the nations and I will cause it to come upon those that will heed your word. Now, let's think for a minute about hell. If you could die right now for just two or three minutes and go to hell, let me tell you what you'd see. You'd see darkness, you'd see hell fire, there'd be probably great smells of sulfur, there'd be screaming, yelling, gnashing of teeth, there'd be demonic powers. It would be one word that would, that would sum up hell would be squalor excessive squalor, no life, no greenery, no light, no nothing, no laughter, just pure hell and squalor. On the other hand, if you could die for about two minutes and go to heaven, let me tell you what you would see. You'd see walls made out of jasper. You'd see streets with asphalt of gold. You'd see sardin. You'd see You'd see diamonds. You'd see emeralds. You'd see, you'd hear laughter. You'd hear joy. You'd hear worship. That's blessings. God epitomizes blessings. Hell epitomizes lack and curses. I got a question. Why in the name of God would anybody serve the devil? Why would anybody serve the devil? And so when you look at the blessings of the Lord, you look at heaven, there's blessings abundant. They're just everywhere. And God said, I want to get back into the affairs of mankind. And he said, Abram, I want to bless you. That was the first time he used those words. I want to bless you. And I want to entrance back into the lives of people. So here's what happened. Go to chapter uh, 13. Look what happened. Abram went up out of Egypt 
he and his wife, and we won't take time to go through the details, and all that he had, a lot was with him. The Bible says Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Look back, chapter 12, verse 2, God said to a man that was an idolater, didn't have anything, a vagabond and a sojourner. God said, I'm gonna bless you. One chapter over, God was so eager to bless him. Now the Bible says in verse two, he was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. What happened? God put him in a situation with Pharaoh. You remember that? And Pharaoh fell for his wife, for Abram's wife. And when he fell for his wife, God brought a curse on the land. Pharaoh began to inquire what's happened found out it was because she was actually his wife and Abram told him she was his sister. And so the Bible says that Pharaoh said to Abram, depart, and I wanna give you plenty of stuff as you depart so as to appease the spirit. God used that situation and the Bible says by the time Abram left that he was very rich in silver and cattle and gold and all those things, God blessed him. Take the blessing away Abram would have been in hot water. Amen? Put the blessing on him. Look what happened. Very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Now, let me show you something else. Turn to chapter 17. I want to show you something about Sarah. Verse 15. Chapter 17, verse 15. God said unto Abraham, As for Sarah, your wife, you won't call her name anymore Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. Look what God said in chapter 17, verse 16. He said, I will bless her. Not only is God going to bless Sarah, Abraham, but he's going to bless Sarai. He said, I will bless her, and I'm going to give her a son. I will bless her. He said it again. And she shall be a mother of nations, and kings of people shall come out of her. Look this way just for a minute. God said, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. He comes up out of Egypt. Very, he just excelled. Blessed him. Then God said, I hadn't forgot your wife. He said, he didn't just say, I'm going to give this old woman a baby. No, here's what he said. He said, I'm going to bless her. You know what happened with the blessings of God? Didn't say he was going to heal her. How many of you know she was 90 years old? How many of you know her womb, she, she had no children. Her womb was past bearing. So you might think that God would have said, Abram, I'm going to heal her. But God didn't say he's going to heal her. He said, I'm going to bless her. So he said, I'm not only going to bless you, and you come up out of Egypt with all this stuff, but he said, call your wife over here. He said, I'm going to bless her. I'm going to give her a baby. And then he said, he's going to bless her the second time. And he said, this time it won't be just a baby, but I'm going to make her mother of nations, and kings will come out of her. You take the blessing away, there's no Isaac. You take the blessing away, and there's no mother of nations. God gave a blessing for each maternal thing that he did in her life. And whenever God blessed her, he didn't say he healed her, but whenever he blessed her, her womb opened up, her skin turned supple, her beauty came back. She was a knockout that a king fell in love with her. Can't you imagine nuzzling up to her and say, how old are you, baby? And she said, well, I'm 90, but I'm blessed. Glory to God. <laughs> Amen. I'm 90, but I'm blessed. Can't you imagine the king said, whoa, whoa. Amen. God didn't heal her. He blessed her. How many of you know that saves a lot of money on skin cream? <laughs> How many of you know Clarol won't get rich off the Christians once they tap into this. Amen? You see what I'm saying? Glory to God. Now watch this. I got to hurry. Let's go look at Isaac right quick. I don't have time. I, I got more to go there on Abraham, but I've got to run. Go to Genesis chapter 25. Look at this. 25 and verse 5. Came time for Abraham to die now. He calls in Isaac, and then he had some sons by some concubines. The Bible says in verse 5, Abram gave all that he had unto Isaac, but unto the sons of the concubines which Abram had, Abram gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son. And then the Bible says that he died. He gave up the ghost in verse 8. Just two verses later, he died. But look this way just for a minute. 
Did you know that before Abraham died, the Bible said he gave gifts to the sons of the concubines, but to Isaac, he gave all that he had. Now, it doesn't mean that he gave him his donkeys and his camels and all that stuff, but I tell you what he gave Isaac, he passed on the blessing that God had on his life, he called Isaac over there, and he kissed it on him. He put it on him. Now, Isaac was the recipient of his father's blessing. Watch this. 25 and verse 11. It came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac dwelt by the well Lahoroi. Look at verse 11. I'm sorry, look at verse, chapter 26, verses 3 and 4. The Lord said unto Isaac, I will be with you and I will bless you. Now he says it to his son. Unto you and unto your seed I will give all these countries and I will perform the oath that I swear unto your father Abraham. I will make your seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and give unto thee the seed of all these countries. And in thy seed, Isaac, shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Because your daddy Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments and my statutes, God said, now the blessing is on you. Now look what happened in verse 12 of chapter 26. The Bible said, Isaac sowed in the land and in that same year received a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him. Verse 13 said he waxed great, went forward, and grew until he became very great. Now watch this, everybody. This is powerful. I want to show you something. Abraham, before he died, called that boy over there, and the way they did it customarily is he'd take him, kiss him, lay his hand on him, and he gave him the blessing that God gave unto him, blessed Isaac. Bible says then that God came and talked to Isaac and said, your daddy kept my, vo kept my word, obeyed my voice, kept my statutes and my commandments. And God said, because your daddy's done that, and because he's blessed you, I'm putting my blessing on you. And the Bible said he sowed that same year and reaped a hundredfold. Now I want to just let you look at that for a minute. You know what that means? Is if you're sowing corn, you'll have to put a kernel here and a kernel way down yonder just one kernel, and a kernel way down yonder, and another kernel way down yonder. You can't plant them close together because a hundredfold is such an increase, you have to make plenty of room for expansion. Take the blessing away, you better fill them troughs full of kernels of corn. But with the blessing of God, a little dab goes a long ways. You follow me? Now, let me show you something else. Friend, has anybody ever said about you, boy, she's blessed? Has anybody ever said about you, man, he's blessed? I want to say this to you. You get the sin out of your life, and you walk holy before God, and you tap into these things that I'm talking about called blessings. Get the sin out. Walk holy before God. Be righteous. And tap into this thing called blessings and let God put that mantle and that pedigree on you. And people will start saying this. I don't understand it, but I tell you, that guy... It looks like he's born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Everything he touches turns to gold. You know what? That's been a child of God, a blessed child of God. You need to walk in that. That beats an education. It beats going out in the world and beating the bushes and making a bunch of money. That adds sorrow. But what God gives you, there's no sorrow with it. And I tell you what else he does. I tell you what else God does. God not only blesses you and has no sorrow with it, but he lets you hang on to it and pass it down to your children after you're gone. You look at these people that come up in the movie star world and look at these people that come up in country music and rock and roll music. They don't have anything to leave to their kids because usually before they die, the devil takes it back and gives it to some other fool. And besides that, by the time they die, they don't even know who their kids are. They had no relationship with them. See what I'm saying? Now watch what happens to Isaac. There's a, there's a phrase here that I want to point out to you that is so powerful. Look in Genesis 26, 28, and 29. 
Let's go back to verse 25. This is powerful. The Bible said he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there, and Isaac's servants digged a well. Verse 27, Isaac said unto them, Where do you come unto me, seeing that you hate me? Send me you've sent me away from you. In other words, they ostracized Isaac. But look what happened when they saw when God blessed him. Verse 28, they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with you. And we said, Let there be now an oath between us and between you. And let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no hurt and that we have not touched you and we have done nothing unto thee but good and have sent thee away in peace. Look at what it says. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. Look what they said about Isaac. They said, Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. I want to ask you a question. Has anybody looked at you and said you're blessed? Has anybody looked at your church and said, oh my God, that's a blessed church. Don't fool that church. There's something about that church. It's more than supernatural. Is there something over there? That place is blessed. Friend, we have been raped in the papers. We have been through some mega hell in this place. But you know what? We're still standing. After seven years, God's power is still here. The papers tried to destroy us. They raped us. The devil got in my ear and screamed out loud, you're done for. The revival's over. Nobody will come. They'll believe all this garbage. But it only just infuriated the power of God, and it got greater and more powerful. Why? Because you cannot curse what God has blessed. Somebody shout amen. Woo! Hallelujah. You cannot curse. I said you cannot curse what God has blessed. You can't do it. Here's what the Bible says. His enemies came back to Isaac and they said, let's be clear about this. They said, we've never tried to do you no hurt. And they said, let's be clear about this too. We want to enter into covenant with you. And they, Isaac said, well, what's this all about? They said this. They said, we see that the Lord is with you now. And we also see that thou art now the blessed of the Lord. You know what happens whenever people realize you're blessed? Even your enemies want to be around you. Let me tell you something about a curse. When there's a curse on you, even your friends don't want to be around you. But when you're blessed, and when you move in blessings, even your enemies will want to get back up under your canopy and say, let's enter into a covenant. Because we now see that, it didn't say, we now see that you're blessed. It says, we now see that thou art the blessed of the Lord. You know what they were saying? There's something on you, Isaac, that you're wearing that we saw on your daddy. Your daddy's gone, but you're wearing something that your daddy had, and oh my, can we enter into covenant with you? Hallelujah? Let's go to Jacob right quick. I'm hurrying. Jacob, Genesis chapter 27. Now, let me just, let me just tell you about this. I want to take time to, to read it. Genesis 27, let me tell you what happened here. I, I got to do it real quick because I, I got to jump ahead of a lot. You remember, you remember Jacob and Esau struggling in Rebecca's, in, in, uh, Rebecca's womb? You remember one had a hold of the heel? And they were born twins. And then when they got here, you remember old Jacob uh, said, I'll give you some, my cereal, give me my pottage for your birthright. And so he got Esau's birthright. Now Esau was the firstborn. Make a long story short, Isaac was dying, blind, couldn't see. Rebecca got in cahoots with Jacob, and she said, let's go in there and get your daddy's blessing. See how important that was in the Old Testament? Friend, it's not only important to get your daddy's blessing, but it's important if people leave your church to get the pastor's blessing. You know why churches suffer? Because a lot of us have people in our congregations that never got the pastor's blessing where they came from. And I wish I had time to talk about that. A lot of that stuff is in these tapes. I wish I had time to talk about it. I don't. But a lot of reasons why 
churches are going through the hell they're going through is because people pops out of one place, causes massacres, tears the preacher down, assassinates his character, and comes in some of the guys' church the next Sunday, gets a membership application, raises their hands, praises God like nothing ever happened, and kill the man where they just left from, never got his blessing, and come in and this other man puts them, starts, talking, uh, starts teaching Sunday school class. You follow me? Friend, I am a firm believer. I'll go to my grave believing this. I'll never change my mind. It's important to get a masculine blessing in your life from your father, your stepfather, your uncle, your grandfather, a pastor, somebody, but it's also tremendously important when you leave a church, get your pastor's blessing. Last Sunday, Family's leaving here, going to start, going to have another church. They're going to start a church up in Virginia. We gave them our blessing. Regularly, when people leave this church, I'll call them up. They ask me, can I have your blessing? And before God and everybody, before the whole congregation, I'll lay my hands on them and bless them. And there's people that's left here that I didn't give them my blessing. And I couldn't give it to them for a certain reason. And it's evident. But I'll tell you something too, friend. They struggle. When things are not done right, they struggle. Are you listening to me? You say, that sounds mighty pompous. No, it's mighty scriptural. Just hear me. I know that's new for some of you, but you need to hear me. Boy, it's important to get that dad's blessing. It's important to get that pastor's blessing. Now, let me talk to you about Jacob for a minute. His mama put some fur on him to make him feel like the blind Isaac that he was Esau. And you remember he went in there had a smell of venison on him. And he told his mama, he said, Mama, I'm afraid to go in there and, 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 and attempt to deceive Daddy to get his blessing. What, what if he finds out? He'll curse me. She said, let thy curse be upon me. Remember what she said? She said, let thy curse be upon me. Do you know that after that passage of Scripture where she said, let your curse be upon me, she made one statement and disappeared from the pages of history. She was gone. She made this one statement. She said, I have despaired of life. That was the last word you heard after she made that statement. She said, I despair of life. And she disappeared from the pages of your Bible. She took it. Jacob went in there. Isaac reared up, smelled that venison, touched his hand, felt that fur. And he spoke the blessing over Jacob. And Isaac came in and wailed in the moment. And he said, not only did he get my birthright, but now he's got my blessing. And he said, Daddy, don't you have a blessing left for me? You remember that? My heart goes out to him. Why? I've got a question for you. Why was that so important to him? Why was it so important in the Old Testament to get that blessing? Why have we lost it today? And he got down and he just moaned and bewailed. And he said, Dad, don't you have a blessing for me? And you remember what Isaac said? He said, Son, what I have blessed, I have blessed. And what he was saying is, I gave it. I gave it. And your brother got it. But you remember old Jacob? He was so hungry for a blessing that you remember he wrestled with that angel? It was the Lord, you remember? He wrestled with him till daylight. And what did he say? I ain't going to let you go. Till what? You bless me. Hey, not only did he have Abraham's blessing, Isaac, his father's blessing, but now he had the blessing of that angel of the Lord himself. Man, he was a hog for blessings. That's John Kilpatrick. I'm a hog for blessings. Amen? Whew, glory to God, I'll tackle the biggest one of them. I ain't going to let you go. He may sling me to Mars, but I tell you what, I'm going to hang on till he blesses me, amen? I want a blessing. Don't you want a blessing? Watch this. Then we find old Uncle Laban. Let's, let's look at this, and I'm going to have to hurry. We find old Uncle Laban. Genesis chapter 30. You remember whenever Jacob had to leave home, he ran? Where did he go to? He went to Uncle Laban's house. And he dwelt there. Look what the Bible says. Look how prevalent this is. Laban in verse 27 says, I pray thee, if I have found favor in your eyes, Jacob, tarry. 
He said, for I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake. See that? Laban said to Jacob, I have learned by experience that God is blessing me because you're in my house. And what he was saying is, please don't leave my house. Please don't leave my house. Here's a swindler. Laban is a bigger swindler than Jacob. How many of you knows when you're a swindler, God will send you to Uncle Laban's house? <laughs> Uncle Laban's a bigger swindler than you are. God's got a Laban forever, Jacob. Amen. But even after all the swindling was over, and after all the deception was over, old Laban looked at Jacob and he said, Oh, my God, don't leave my house. Pray, I tell you, stay here. He said, For I have learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me because you're here on the premises. Wow. I got a question. Do people on your job really realize who you are? Did you know they ought to hate it like everything when you take off and go on vacation? You know what I'm saying? When you go on vacation, everything ought to plummet. And they ought to be calling you up saying, where are you at? I'm in Acapulco. Get home, hurry. <laughs> Why? Because everything's going down. Get back here so we can be blessed again. What Laban was saying to Jacob was, hey, Jacob, don't, 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 don't leave me. Let's work out whatever we've got to work out, but don't leave me. Stay here because I've learned by experience that God's blessing me because you're here on the premises. You know what? I believe that Brownsville ought to be blessed because John Kilpatrick's here. And if I ever resign, they ought to call me and say, Brother Kilpatrick, please come back. You know, that's the way it ought to be. I ought not to leave in a huff. I ought not to leave cursing everybody. I ought not to leave with splitting division in my heart. I ought to leave blessing the church, amen? And the next man they get in who ought to be a blesser also and bless the place. But they ought to hate to see me go and not rejoice and clap whenever I leave. They ought to say, Brother Kilpatrick, we believe God's blessing Brownsville because of you. Because you fear God and you love God and you're principled and you try to have integrity and don't leave us because we feel like we're blessed because of you. That's the way it ought to be in your life. People ought to hate to see you go, friend. They ought to, they ought to not rejoice to see you go. Amen? I love my wife and if she ever got ready to leave me, I'd hate to see her go because God blesses me because of her. And God blesses her because of me. Now watch this one more place and I gotta hurry. Let's look at Joseph. Joseph. Genesis 39. Then we're going to Luke and I'm gonna close. Genesis 39 verse one. The Bible says Joseph was brought down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him of the hands of Ishmaelites, which brought him down thither. The Lord was with Joseph. He was a prosperous man. He was in the house of his master, the Egyptian, and his master saw, look at that. His master saw that the Lord was with Joseph and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Verse five. It came to pass from that time that he had made him overseer in his house and over all that he had that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. God blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all he had in the house and in the field. Look at that. God blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph's sake. Did you know that your presence even causes blessings to come on sinners that you rub shoulders with. And let me ask you a question. Look this way, everybody, just for a minute. Let me ask you a question. Did you know that one day real soon, God is going to let the world wake up and realize that you are indeed the salt and the light of the world and that they're blessed because of the church? And I'll tell you something else. If you don't think you're blessed, what happens when the rapture takes place and we're caught out of here? When he that letteth will it until he be taken out of the way, then all hell breaks loose on the earth. Why does all hell break loose on the earth? Because the church is gone. The blessed is gone. Now the curse comes. And the, the world doesn't even really realize 
that we're here and we're blessed. I'm here to tell you tonight, today, you are blessed. Start moving in that blessing. Start getting an air about you, not a pride, but start moving in an air that I'm blessed. God's with me. Wherever I go, I'm blessed. And whoever gets around me, the blessing is rubbing off on them. It's not a pride thing, friend, but begin to act like it and move in it, and you'll begin to see things happen in your church, in your community, and in your family. Now, I'm going to close with this one. This is so powerful. I could take you to a lot of other ones. Let me just tell you about this one out of Galatians. Do you remember the Bible said that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles? Everybody that's Christians knows about that verse. You know that the Bible says because of Abraham, now in the death of Jesus Christ, that the blessings might come on the Gentiles through Abraham. Now that Christ opened up the way by Calvary and by his blood, the blessing that was on Abraham, the blessing that was on Isaac, on Jacob, on Joseph, and all of them, that blessing now, through the death and burial and resurrection of Christ, and us putting our faith in him, that blessing has come upon us. Now here's the deal. You remember the Bible says in Galatians that God before preached the gospel unto Abraham? You remember that? You know what the gospel is? The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. You know what God did? He actually preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to Father Abraham. God did. The Bible says God preached the gospel unto Abraham. Can you imagine Jehovah saying, turn with me in your Bibles? <laughs> And God preached to Abraham the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Told him about his son. Told him he was going to die on Calvary. Shed his blood. And he said, Abraham, the blessings that I put on you. You remember I told you that all the nations of the earth would be blessed through you? He said, Abraham, when my son dies on Calvary and sheds his blood, I'm going to let the blessing that I pronounced over you come on all, both Jew and Gentiles. And it will come on Jesus Christ. Now, let me close with this. This is so powerful. I read the Bible through so many times and I've never seen this until last Easter. And I've been preaching on blessings for years. But when I saw this last Easter, man, it clinched it for me. Turn to the book of Luke. Book of Luke, chapter 24. Somebody says, Brother Kilpatrick, is there such thing in the Bible, the New Testament, as blessings? Well, I got a question for you. You remember the day that Jesus was walking through and the disciples were sort of like the an entourage going around him, you know, and Jesus was walking through and the disciples was coming through, you know, and they was making, all right, back up, make way for the master. The master's coming. Back up, everybody. Hey, you get out of the way over there. The master's coming. You know, old Peter, boisterous Peter. And then there was a parent standing out there holding their baby. They wanted the Lord to bless their baby, you remember? And um, Peter said, hey, hey, back up there. Jesus said, whoa, 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 hold the procession. He said, wait a minute, suffer the little children to come unto me. And the Bible says he took that little child, you read it in your Bible, and laid his hands on him. Didn't say he healed him. Said he laid his hands on him and blessed that child. Oh, I would love for that to have been my grandchild. Come here, Zachary. Glory to God. Let Jesus put his hand on you. Calm you down some. Hallelujah. <laughs> the way it is at our house, we hear Carla pull up in the driveway, and I say, Ah! Brenda, put up all the china. Get everything off the coffee table. Here they come. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we run around in, in 78 and speed, <laughs> putting everything up. Oh, hi. Come on in. God bless you all. But the Bible says that Jesus laid his hands on them and blessed them. Now, so there's blessings in the New Testament. But oh, i got something to share with you, friend. When Jesus came on the earth, he healed the sick, he raised the dead, he cast out demons. But the last thing he did before he went up into heaven, I saw this last Easter. Man, it just blessed me. The last thing he did was watch this. Luke 24 and verse... Forty-nine. 
The Bible says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. And he told him, he said, I want you to tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. Look at this. He led them out as far as to Bethany. Oh, man. And he lifted up his hands and blessed them. Look this way for a minute. It said he led them out as far as Bethany, but where did the Lord go up from? He went up from the Mount of Olives. But he wouldn't let them come no further than Bethany. And you know, it said in like manner as he went, he'll come. I believe the rapture is going to be in more slow motion than we can think. <coughs> I know we're going to be changed in a moment, twinkling of an eye. But Jesus went up like this, and as he was going up, he was going up so high and so powerful that they was in Bethany, and he was over there on the Mount of Olives, and his voice was so loud, and he had his hands up, and he was speaking a blessing over them. He was going up slow enough that the last words out of his mouth going up through the clouds back into heaven was he was blessing his disciples. See that? Watch this. It said, he led them out as far as Bethany. He lifted up his hands, and he blessed them, and it came to pass while he blessed them he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. You know what happened? Let me tell you what happened. After Jesus died on Calvary, he walked on the earth for 40 days, you remember? As proof. He was producing proof that he was who he said he was. He walked on the earth for 40 days, seen him in, handled him in, but right after his death, burial, and resurrection, after that 40 days of testing was over, and he's getting ready now to go up, he was so anxious that the blessings of Abraham might come on the Gentiles that the Lord Jesus himself opened up the way and spoke the blessings on the Gentile church himself. And you know what? It hurts me to hear born-again Christians powerful Christians don't even realize they're blessed just speaking curses over themselves, speaking curses over their church, speaking curses over their family, over their husbands, their wives, their children. I hear women cursing their own self. I hate my legs. I hate my lips. I hate my facial features. I hate my hair. It's amazing. Things that we speak out of our mouth in the way of a curse. I'm not talking about cussing. Cussing is profanity. Cursing is speaking things that you don't want to see come to pass. And it just breaks my heart that the Lord was so anxious for the blessings to come on the Gentile church. And he blessed us, left a blessing behind him. The Bible said he left a blessing behind him. And then here we are in light of him blessing us and opening the way for blessings to come upon us. All we can move in is curses. I got one question and I promise I close. What would happen in America this Sunday, if every congregation would stop cursing their, their pastor and staff and the programs and the activities of their church and would let nothing come out of their mouth for the next 30 days but blessings, you know what would happen? The devil would fall into cardiac arrest. The devil would fall into cardiac arrest. And I'll tell you what else would happen. Revival would break out widespread all over America. Because now people's got a guard at their lips and they won't allow anything to come out they don't want to see come to pass. And they just start blessing their pastor, blessing the program, blessing the church, blessing the staff. And all of a sudden, when the music cranks up the next Sunday, oh my God, the atmosphere would become saturated and God would break out in a powerful way. You know what I want us to do right now? Here's what the Bible even says in Psalms 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul. All that is within me, bless his holy name. You know, I used to hear my pastor years ago. His name was R.C. Wetzel. I used to hear him. He had this old gravelly preacher's voice, you know. He used to always say things like, bless God. You ever heard them old preachers say that? And the first time I ever heard him say that, I was just a kid, and I thought, well, what's, what does that mean, bless God? He needs to be blessing us. We don't need to bless him. He's the blesser. And he used to go around all the time saying, bless God. 
And I never could figure that out. And then one day I looked in the scripture. And the Bible says, even when you come in before the Lord, it says there's a protocol of heaven. Enter into his gates with, and his courts with. It didn't say enter into his gates with belly aching. It didn't say enter into his gates with complaining, criticizing, backbiting. <laughs> oh, God poured me. It says enter into his gates with, and his courts with praise. And then the Bible says when you get there, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Don't you allow no curses to come out of your mouth. There's a protocol meeting the Queen of England. There's a protocol meeting kings. Protocol meeting the president. Protocol meeting the prime minister. What about God? You don't come in belly aching. He's God. And the Bible says, bless the Lord. Oh my soul. Well, stand up. Hallelujah. Oh, lift up your voices. Come on. Shay, Holy Ghost. Whoa. All that is within me, bless his holy name. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord, we bless you, Lord, we bless you, Lord. Sondoro Baba Baba Bayando. I want to challenge you before I let you go. I want to challenge you. Just if you want to get a, get a copy of this back there. If you get some product, there's no charge for these. But go back there and pick up one of these and just go home and start blessing your church this Sunday. It's called a pastoral blessing. Let it be the last thing you do before you dismiss it. And if you don't want to do this one, just use this as an example. Just use it as a model and write your own. Start speaking a blessing. I challenge you. Start speaking a blessing over your congregation. See what happens. Hey, get this. Find you some other scriptures. Go to your house. Start anointing the doorposts. Start speaking peace over your bedroom. You're not praying now. And you're not prophesying. You got your eyes wide open and you're blessing it and start blessing your house, see what happens. Start, call your children home and revoke any curse you've ever spoken over them and apologize to them. Lay your hand on them and start releasing a blessing over your oldest first and then your youngest as they go down. Start blessing your children, see what happens. And then start, instead of praying over your offering, Start speaking this tither's blessing when you get ready to receive the offering. Just have your tithers stand on Sunday. It may shock you at first. <laughs> God, got 2,000 people and 100 tithers. <laughs> but anyway, have your tithers stand and start speaking a blessing over your tithers. Watch miracles break out. The words that I hear more than any other words about, about, around Brownsville is this. Pastor, you just won't believe what's happened it all the time. I ain't going to give in to no curse. I'm not going to curse nobody. I'm not going to curse no place. And I'm not going to curse no circumstance. I'm not going to curse no lions. I'm going to bless them. You understand what I'm saying to you? We are called not only to bless, but to be a blessing. I've enjoyed it. God bless you. Thank you very much.